early on in parenting uh, our son Henry, it didn't take very long for us to realize that when Henry didn't get what he wanted, Henry could get real angry, and then upon getting really angry, Henry's fists would start flying. So we wanted to reinforce with Henry that, of course, hitting is inappropriate, but we wanted Henry to do more than just stop hitting. We wanted Henry to understand uh, the motivation behind his anger and his fist throwing. So in one of my first attempts uh, to talk with Henry uh, about this, he had hit his sisters. Uh, they came downstairs and told on him, of course. I took Henry into the half bath to, uh, to, to try to get below the surface of his, of his anger and his hitting. I can remember him sitting on the commode and I said to Henry, Henry, why do you hit your sisters? And his reply was, I don't know. Now, if I were to ask them, th him this today and he said, I don't know, it would be because he's trying to be a stinker. Okay, he's trying to throw up a smoke screen. Uh, but in those original conversations, you could see this look on Henry's face of, I really don't know. And so I would say, do you think it's because you're mad? And he would say, yes. And I'd say, well, Henry, why are you mad? And he would have this confused look on his face and he'd say, I don't know. And I'd say, do you think you're mad because they took your toy and they wouldn't give it back? And he said, yes, they took my toy and they wouldn't give it back. And I would say, so because you didn't get a toy when you wanted it, you were willing to hurt your sisters? And he'd say, I guess so. Now, <clears throat> Henry's answers are both honest and sad. How many times have you looked at somebody's behavior and you've wondered, why are they doing that? Or maybe more importantly, you've looked at your own behavior. You've said something nasty. Uh, you've withheld your love. Uh, you, you slandered and gossiped and, and you didn't mean to. It just kind of slipped out. And we ask ourselves the question, why do I keep doing that? A lot of times our answer is, we just don't know. And whereas that, that answer is honest, it is also very sad because it's important for us to know why we do the things that we do and in particular, why we do the evil things that we do. Now, <clears throat> Israel, Israel is wandering in the desert and they're gonna be doing this for another 40 years when we look at Numbers uh, chapter 13 and 14. And Israel, you can imagine, wonders, I, I know we disobeyed God, but, but really we disobeyed and now we have to wonder for 40 years in the wilderness, why are we doing this? You can imagine that they could even blame God. You know, Egypt wasn't great, but I mean, at least we had some food and we weren't gonna die out here. And so you can imagine maybe Israel being confused, uh, blaming God, not understanding uh, why she's done what she's done and understand what God's trying to do. So, <clears throat> so God writes a book, right? God moves Moses to write the book of Genesis to explain to Israel not only who he is, but who they are. And when it comes to the evil things that we do and people do and that Israel has done, God explains to us in Genesis chapter 4 why evil exists. And it's because of sin. Starting today, we're going to look at the nature of sin. And in specific, today, we're going to look at where sin is comes from. And in many ways, it's what I'm trying to explain to Henry 
when I say to him, why are you doing that? Well, I don't know. I want Henry to know. It's in best, in Henry's best interest to know that he sins and the nature of his sin and where his sin comes from. So just as a father wants to inform his son, to to benefit and bless his son, to know about his sin and to know how to overcome sin, God, living in the tabernacle among his people and writing this book about sin, is like a father shepherding his children to know why they do the things that they do. So let's look today, take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 4, as we begin to look at the nature of sin and today the reality that sin lives inside of us. Sin is not something out there, but sin is something that originates deep inside and in our heart. We look today at the account of Cain and Abel. Let's read that together. Genesis chapter 4 verses 1 through 10. Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time came Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard or respected Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no respect or no regard. So Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to his brother Abel, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel, and he killed him. Many times when we come to this passage, we get off track of Moses' purpose in writing, and we begin to debate why God regards or respects or accepts Abel's offering, but he does not accept Cain's offering. Now, it's not the point of the sermon today to fully answer that other than to simply say this. It seems to me, and it seems from 1 John chapter 3 and other accounts, that Cain's offering and Abel's offering are in an extension or an overflow of the condition of their heart. Jesus speaks to this when he says that a good man, uh, out of the good nature of his heart, does good things. And likewise, an evil man, out of the evil intent of his heart, does evil things. So I don't know that it's necessary to focus on Abel bringing a lamb and Cain bringing fruit. And even if that is an issue, the bigger issue there is the heart of the worshiper. It's interesting here that it says that God doesn't have regard for Cain or his sacrifice, demonstrating that it originates with Cain's character or Cain's heart. God tells Cain, That sin is a living, breathing power that wants to consume Cain, but Cain won't rule over it. So in addition to his sacrifice being an extension from his inside character, later in this passage in verse 5, he connects this idea that, that Cain, when he's confronted by God, is not open to, to change or open to God's will. And God warns him and says, sin is not just doing what God doesn't want us to do, but sin is a living, breathing entity that is going to consume Cain. Not from the outside, but it's going to consume Cain from the inside out. So when we look at the nature of sin, the whole point of today is to look at this reality that sin lives on the inside. And we see this with Cain, both in the sacrifice that he offers and in God's confrontation of him. It's 
the inside of Cain. Now, James chapter 1 explains more concisely, theologically, this concept and what's going on here with Cain and Abel. So I would encourage you to take your Bibles and turn to James chapter 1, and we're going to look just at verse 14 and 15. Look in verse 14. He says, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. I want you to notice here a couple of things. First, I want you to notice how James demonstrates just what we're seeing in Genesis, that sin is not an out there thing that we catch, like a virus, but it is something that comes from the inside and it infects everything that we do on the outside. Notice he says here, each person is tempted. He says here also that he individually is lured and that that person is enticed by what? Someone else's desires? No, by his own desires. It's interesting here that he uses the word lured, uh, a fishing concept, right? You throw the lure into uh, the pond or the river. What are you trying to do? You're trying to deceive uh, the fish in order to, to catch them and drag them out of their environment. The desire on the inside is what causes us to go after the lure on the outside. And we're dragged away by our inward desire. Now, we're not going to do, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the scripture seems to paint for us six ruling desires that, that are found inside of sinful people, which is everybody, of course. Now, it's not to say that everybody has these six sinful desires, but everybody has at least one of these ruling desires from the inside, okay? You may have a unique taste or desire for perfection. That would look like the desire to control others or to control your surroundings. You may not have a desire or a unique taste for perfection, but you may have a unique taste for praise. The desire to be recognized, to be visibly approved or verbally, uh, to be respected. So perfection, praise, or maybe peace. The desire to live a conflict-free, easy, convenient life. I'll be honest with you, that's mine. Or you may have a unique taste for preservation. The desire to please people, not out of a desire to serve and love them, but a desire to please people out of fear of what they can do to you. Try to appease them so that they won't hurt you or malign you. Or maybe you have a unique, a unique taste for pleasure. The desire for prosperity or the seeking of comfort or to amass possessions, we call this person materialistic. Lastly here, you may have a unique taste for privilege, the desire to claim entitlement or position. Now, a lot of these in and of themselves, these ruling desires are not evil, but when they are combined with the desire to be worshiped, they become ways that we try to um, manipulate people or manipulate circumstances in order that our desire might be fulfilled. So we go after the sin because we're going after the fulfillment of that desire. During a family vacation years ago when I was a boy, we went to Disney World and uh, we set up our tent camper and right behind it was this really nice size creek or crick. And during the, during the hottest part of the day, my parents and my sisters would go back to the camper and they'd lay in the air conditioning and it was my opportunity to go fishing. So we didn't have any worms, but I'd get my pole and I'd get my hook and uh, I'd grab a, a bag of bread and I'd head down to the bridge. I'd take a little pinch of bread, I'd put it around the hook to disguise it, I'd throw it, in, I'd throw it into the creek, and lo and behold, I would catch a fish. And some of these fish 
were gigantic. And of course, I'd have to go back and show my dad. My dad said to me one day, he said, how are you catching all these big fish? And I said, or what are you using? Because he knew I didn't have worms. I said, I've been using bread. My dad said, you can't catch fish with bread. Everybody knows that. I said, well, I am. He said, that's impossible. So the next day we found a bait and tackle shop and we bought red worms. And we went down to where I'd been fishing and we baited the hook with red worms. We threw it in and the fish didn't bite at all. So without him looking, I took a pinch of bread, put around my hook, cast it in, had a fish just like that. He looks at me and he says, see, I told you those worms were, would work. And I said, Dad, I caught it on bread. And he was puzzled. He started laughing. I started laughing. You know, in Ohio, we'd been fishing. We always caught fish on red worms or wax worms, never on bread. But these fish in Florida had developed a special taste for bread. You know why? because this was a tourist attraction with geese and there were lots of families. So families would feed bread to the geese and the fish had developed a particular taste for that particular thing, for bread. They didn't want worms. They didn't want wax worms. They wanted bread. All of us have a ruling desire, but we don't have the same ruling desire. So I look at Bob's sin over here and I can't understand why Bob gets tripped up with this sin. Well, it's because Bob has a ruling desire that I don't possess. Also, Bob can look at my life and say, why does Matt get tripped up with this sin? I don't understand it. Well, in some ways, Bob doesn't have to understand it. He just knows that I have a ruling desire and it's attracted to a particular taste. For me, it's ease of life and conflict-free living. I, I probably shouldn't have chosen to be a pastor or a husband or a father, okay? But we do. When we walk with Jesus, we can overcome these desires and commit them to Christ for Him to fulfill us. But when we walk in the flesh, these desires are deep within us. So I want us to know this, that sin comes from inside. Sin comes from inside, from a particular desire that we possess. Now, James 1 goes on to talk about four stages of, of temptation. And the first stage we've already addressed, the desire, the want. I believe that we're all born with a particular bent towards a certain ruling desires. Sometimes these are family sins, other times they come out of the blue, but it is the corruption of the sin, or it's the corruption of sin passed down from Adam and Eve to Cain and Abel to you and me that we just want and have developed a taste for particular sin. Eve sees the fruit, wants to be wise. Cain doesn't get the respect that he wants and is entitled to, so he kills his brother. Eve's sin Cain's sin manifests itself differently, but it still comes from the inside desire. So that's stage number one. But James goes on in chapter uh, 1, 14 and 15, and says this, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So the first stage of temptation is desire. We carry that around with us all the time. The second stage is enticement. Common word that we might use today is being triggered. Okay? These triggers can be obvious. We see a sex scene on TV. We hear a suggestive lyric in a song we're listening to. A kid's disrespect would trigger certainly the, the sense of privilege and entitlement in a parent who struggles with that desire, or the loss of a, of a job would threaten and trigger materialistic leanings. But there are also some less obvious ones. Seasons of stress can trigger inner desires. Exhaustion and fatigue, boredom. I know for myself, some of my hardest, most difficult days struggling with my own desire are my days off when I have lots of time to think. Sometimes that's not good for me. I want you to notice here when it comes to enticement and trigger, God doesn't accept Cain's sacrifice, confronts Cain, and this triggers Cain's desire for entitlement or recognition. 
Now, I want us to know that just because we're enticed by sin or triggered by this, especially for the Christian, doesn't mean we have to give in to sin. In fact, in in Genesis 4, 7, he tells Cain to rule over the sin. And for the Christian, by the power of the Spirit, we have the ability not to give in to that desire or that trigger, but we can have victory over it. But the reality is, sometimes we do give in to it. And when we give in to it, James says, that's when sin occurs, the sinful act. So Cain wants to be respected or feels entitled. God confronts him. That's the trigger. But instead of ruling over it, Cain gives in to the sin. He has this in his has this inside desire is not met by God. It's triggered. And how does he deal with it? Not through repentance. He turns his anger towards Abel, not his sin, and he kills Abel. Israel does the same thing. They miss ease and comfort of Egypt, which is a lie, because they were enslaved. And they're triggered by the evil report of the, tw- of the ten of twelve spies that go into the promised land. And instead of saying, no, God can do this, they refuse to go in and they commit the act of sin. So in many sense, sin is birthed and comes to fruition in their life. Now notice here, the fourth stage of, of temptation and of the nature of sin Desire, enticement, the sin itself, conception. Notice the fourth stage is death. He says, Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Cain's life, he thinks it's bad, but it goes from bad to worse. Now, the death that James is talking about here is not necessarily physical death. Now, when Eve and Adam sin, physical death becomes a part of the equation. When Cain sins, death is part of it because he kills Abel. But that's not the only way, that's not the only result of sin. This death that James talks about, talks about the the personal and relational destruction that sin causes in our life. With Adam and Eve, it isn't just that death becomes a part of the human equation. But their desire to be like God, their enticement of the fruit, their eating of the fruit, now also brings into the human equation shame, relational distancing, deceit, hiding from each other and with God. All of a sudden now there's been a destruction in in Adam and Eve's relationship that they never had before. In Cain, Cain's desire to do things on his own He's enticed to rebel when he's confronted by God. He gives in to that. He kills Abel and death occurs. Not just the death of Abel, but notice in the rest of chapter 4, the destruction in Cain's life and in his relationships. In Genesis 4, 11, God tells Cain that the ground will no longer yield a living for him. Basically, Cain's lost his job. A pastor who commits sexual sin, loses his job. A congressman, a senator, uh, uh, an elected official who's found to be breaking breaking trust of his constituents, loses his or her job. Uh, A CFO who is found to be embezzling money in order to live a luxurious lifestyle. When that's found out, guess what? loses its job. Cain loses his job. All of his financial security is ripped out from underneath of him. This is one of the destructive consequences of his sin. In chapter 11, or chapter 4, verse 11, we also see that he's told that he's going to become a fugitive and a wanderer. Makes me wonder what's going to happen now to Cain's relationship with his mom and dad. If he's going to be a a, a wanderer and a fugitive, is he going to have a relationship with them? And even if he can stay close, are they going to want a relationship with him? It's also interesting to me that Genesis is written to a wandering generation of Israelites. Why is Israel wandering in the wilderness? As a consequence of their sin? Cain is wandering 
because of a consequence of his sin. Adam and Eve are expelled to wander outside the garden because of the consequence of their sin. Sin brings forth death. It brings, it brings forth destruction. You and I could probably give testimony of times in our lives where we felt like we were wandering in a desert, where our spiritual life felt dry and lifeless and frustrated. Why? Because we gave in to our desire and we sinned and there, there's destruction and, um, and hardship as a result. Chapter 4, verse 13, we see Cain gets paranoid. There's a connection between sin and paranoia. There's a proverb that says something like, a wicked man always thinks that a lion is coming to get him. <laughs> it's like he lives not in reality, but this paranoia. It's interesting, isn't it? Liars always tend to think that people are lying to them. Um, people that are greedy are always thinking that people are out to screw them over financially. Um, people that are sexually promiscuous are always thinking that everybody else is cheating and sexually promiscuous. It's, it's interesting that in our desires and giving over to sin, we, we tend to then develop a paranoia that develops along those same lines. And then, of course, in chapter 4, verse 16, Cain chooses to leave the presence of the Lord. One of the greatest destructive things about sin is its distancing of us and our relationship with Christ. Well, Israel needs to know this. Israel needs to know this because she is wandering in the desert because of sin. And sin, her sin and the destruction of it isn't because of the Egyptians. It isn't because of Moses. It isn't because of the inhabitants of the promised land. It's because of the sin in her own heart. Her desire for comfort and ease she becomes enticed with the evil report of the spies and fear begins to dominate her heart. It brings for, it, it, it is conceived when she refuses to enter the promised land. And then, of course, sin never pays. And we see the death that Israel experiences, not only the physical death, but the struggle and the suffering that's going to go on these next 40 years in the life of Israel. Henry needs to know why he sins. Henry needs to know where sin comes from. It's not enough for Henry just to stop hitting his sisters. I mean, don't get me wrong. That would be wonderful for all of us, especially his sisters. But if Henry doesn't understand that there is a desire in his heart and that when it is not met, he gets angry. And when he gets angry, he gets physically abusive. He is going to repeat this issue over and over and over and over in his life. And it is going to cause a lot of hardship. It's already caused hardship in our home. It's going to cause hardship in his relationships with his, with his co-workers, with his, with his significant others, with, with his parents. And so I would encourage you today to think about what sin you find in your own life. And my guess is, if you were honest, there is a pattern of sinful behavior that you can say, when I sin, I usually sin like this. I get nasty in what I say. I get moody. I withhold my love. Okay. But I'm asking you to look below the act to say, what is that sinful desire? Is it pleasure? Is it possessions? Is it privilege? Is it peace? What is that? And if we know what that is and we take ownership of the reality that it comes within, we'll begin to understand why we do what we do. And we can battle back against it by the power of the Spirit. And we can live a life that is known by healing and grace and edification. So my question to you today is, why do you sin? Understanding that the sin is not out there the sin is in your own heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sharing with us who we are and why we are. And even though it is hard to come to the reality that we sin, I pray that, that you would help us to accept that, that, your diagnosis of our problem. And I pray, Father, that you would help us in coming to grips with who we are that we could become more like Jesus as we allow you to heal and fulfill those unique desires.
We offer these things up to you. We pray that we would do these things out of a love and a devotion for you and out of a desire for you to heal us and heal our relationships. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.